on World News Tonight. Jabbing away, Israel administers a second booster vaccine to contend with Omicron. Woeful winter, traveling on the west coast being made near impossible by the adverse weather. Nuclear negotiations, tensions rise in Vienna as Iranian nuclear talks recommence. Potter party, Potter heads united celebration of 20 years of the wizarding world. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is the Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with the updates on the COVID crisis. A Sydney lab has told hundreds of people they did not have COVID when they, they in fact, had tested positive amid soaring infections in the area. Let's cross over to other than World News Special Correspondent Timothy Philip from Melbourne in Australia for more. Timothy? Yes, Shana. The mistake which took place over the Christmas period was due to a data processing error. The Australian state of New South Wales is seeing rising infection numbers following the arrival of the hyperinfectious Omicron COVID variant. Officials say an increase in swabbing tests have caused massive backlogs. Some of those affected have expressed concern that they may have unknowingly infected their loved ones over Christmas. The SIDPATH lab apologized in a statement and said the mistake which affected 886 people in total had happened as workers faced an unprecedented volume of tests. The blunder grew when SIDPATH later revealed that hundreds more had been prematurely told they had tested negative when their results had not yet been determined. The lab said 486 people from this group had been confirmed as COVID positive. Testing services in New South Wales have been struggling with high demand. Many have reported being turned away at clinics which had reached full capacity, while others have complained of long waits for test results. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than our world news special correspondent Timothy Philip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. An Israeli hospital administered fourth COVID-19 vaccine doses to a test group of health workers. This second booster is the first of its kind and Couple Help manages the fast-spreading Omicron variant. Israel on Monday administered a second round of COVID-19 booster shots to a test group of health workers in what it said was the first major study into whether the additional boosters will help fight the fast-spreading Omicron variant. Professor Jacob Lavi of Sheba Medical Center outside of Tel Aviv said he was first to get the jab, which marks his fourth shot total. To paraphrase an old saying, it's a small jab in the shoulder, probably a giant step for mankind. A health ministry expert panel last week recommended that Israel become the first country to offer a fourth vaccine dose or second booster shot to those over age 60, those suffering from compromised immune systems and to medical workers. The proposal was welcomed by the Israeli government in a country where turnout for vaccines appears to be plateauing. Professor Gili Regev Yohai is the study's director. We'll have initial data within a few days about the safety, and I think then we'll feel more safe to say, okay, everybody who has immune suppression can go and get it. Or uh, people, if we see that we have an outbreaks with severe disease in, uh, in uh, elderly homes, maybe we should uh, recommend them, but we'll have a little bit basis on how much uh, immunogenicity this uh, raises this fourth vaccine. Israel was the fastest country to roll out initial vaccinations a year ago and became one of the first to launch a booster program after observing that immunity waned over time. On Monday, the health ministry said it was shortening the time between offering the second and third doses of COVID-19 vaccines to three months from five in order to beat back rising infections. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett has been in self-isolation at home since Sunday after his 14-year-old daughter tested positive with what his office says is probably the Omicron variant. He subsequently tested negative and is working from home. Over in France, President Emmanuel Macron is expected to announce new restrictions as COVID cases surge due to the Omicron variant. As Omicron infections surge, the French government is weighing its options. 
Currently, a person who's been exposed to the Omicron variant has to isolate for seven days. It increases to 17 days for those who live in the same household with someone who's tested positive. With the number of people on sick leave rising rapidly, many are questioning whether the country can keep its current quarantine rules. Other possible options, a kind of super vaccine pass with three vaccine doses plus a negative COVID test, which could be required for certain venues like nightclubs. Officials are also considering introducing a curfew for New Year's Eve, while the school holidays could be extended. A proposition supported by the medical community. In an article in Sunday's paper, 50 health care workers urged the health minister to extend the school holiday period. Whilst France is tightening restrictions, the United States health officials cut isolation restrictions for Americans who catch the coronavirus from 10 to 5 days and similarly shortened the time that close contacts need to quarantine. COVID travel woes have returned to airports, with the Omicron variant spreading rapidly even among airline staff. Thousands of flights have been cancelled and delayed in the United States alone. At Seattle Airport, passengers found themselves stranded over the Christmas weekend and beyond. The worsening airline staff shortages have prompted Anthony Fauci the U.S. government's top infectious disease expert to suggest that a vaccine mandate could be considered for domestic flights. At the same time, health officials are scrambling to come up with ways to minimise the impact on business and movement. The CDC has shortened its recommended isolation time for people who have tested positive from 10 days to 5 days if they don't have symptoms and continue to wear a mask for 5 more days. It also says people who have received a booster shot of a COVID vaccine or are within six months of receiving their second dose don't have to quarantine even if they have been exposed to the virus. The CDC says the change is motivated by science based on what they know so far about the Omicron variant. For international travellers entering the United States, tight restrictions remain in place, including a requirement for a negative COVID test result less than 24 hours old. China has replaced Shen Kuangu, who as Communist Party chief in the Xinjiang region oversaw a security crackdown targeting ethnic Uyghurs and other Muslims in the name of fighting religious extremism. From Tibet to Xinjiang, Chen Kuangguo was Beijing's man for controlling what the Communist Party saw as ethnic unrest. He served as party secretary of the Tibet Autonomous Region from 2011, where he waged a, quote, stability maintenance campaign, beefing up the police force and clamping down on Buddhist monks and pro-independence protesters. After arriving in Xinjiang in 2016, Chen began rolling out a sweeping crackdown on the Uyghur and other ethnic minorities in the name of fighting religious extremism. Last year, the United States placed him on a sanctions list, accusing him of conducting serious human rights abuses through a comprehensive surveillance, detention and indoctrination program in Xinjiang. More than one million Muslims are estimated to have been detained in so-called re-education camps across the region. Chen's track record of managing restive regions has helped him move up the ladder within the Communist Party. He is currently one of the 25 members of China's Politburo and could possibly be further promoted at next year's party congress. His replacement, Ma Xingri, has been governor of Guangdong province since 2017. With a background in aerospace engineering, Ma may focus more on Xinjiang's economic development. The quiet move comes just a few days after US President Joe Biden signed into law a ban on imports from the region, including cotton, over human rights concerns. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Negotiations to salvage the 2015 Iran nuclear deal resumed in late November after Donald Trump unilaterally withdrew back in 2018. The new developments came about following a five-month hiatus after the election of ultra-controversial Iran President Ibrahim Raisi. An eighth round of talks aimed at salvaging the Iran nuclear deal kicked off in Vienna on Monday. 
Tehran has maintained its focus on one side of the original 2015 bargain, demanding sanctions against it be lifted. They've also refused to meet directly with U.S. officials, forcing the deal's remaining parties to shuttle between the two sides. Little remains of the original deal. It had lifted sanctions on Iran in exchange for restrictions on its nuclear activity. Then U.S. President Donald Trump pulled out of the deal in 2018 and reimposed sanctions. That prompted Tehran to breach and even exceed many of those nuclear restrictions. The previous round of talks ended a little over a week ago after adding some new Iranian demands, with Western powers warning that time was running out for negotiations. Iran insists all U.S. sanctions must be lifted before steps are taken on the nuclear side, while Western negotiators say both demands must be balanced. U.S. sanctions have slashed Iran's oil exports, its main source of revenue. Tehran does not disclose data, but shipping assessments suggest a fall from around 2.8 million barrels per day in 2018 to a fraction of that volume, as low as 200,000. Across the United States, 25 million Americans are under winter weather alerts in the west parts of California saw snow and dangerous whiteout conditions. Oregon was pummeled with snow and Washington is preparing for a cold snap. A blast of winter weather turning parts of the West into a blustering snow globe, making holiday travel treacherous. In Northern California, whiteout conditions on the road. It was so bad that it would be basically impossible to get from one exit to another. The Sierra Mountains hit with several feet of snow, shattering December records, burying houses, stranding travelers. It's, it's been bad. Shutting down several major interstates. The blizzard sparking several spin-outs, accidents, and roadside rescues. This is the most snow we've had in at least in 12 years. The mountain snow direly needed. After years of thinning, the Sierra snowpack, which fuels much of California's water supply, got a major boost. But the snowfall overwhelming Lake Tahoe ski resorts, forcing them to shut down. Authorities there searching for a 43-year-old skier missing since Saturday. Across the country, 25 million Americans enter winter weather alerts from coast to coast. In the Pacific Northwest, frigid temperatures causing winter worries. Parts of Oregon getting pummeled, while Washington State preps for an unusual cold snap. In the Midwest, blizzard conditions blasting the region from Minnesota to the Dakotas. In Fargo, near zero visibility as the region braces for bitter cold. Wind chills as low as 50 below zero in the forecast. A dangerous deep freeze closing out the year with more to come. Still in the United States, President Joe Biden has signed the National Defense Authorization Act, proving nearly 770 billion U.S. dollars in defense pending. The legislation also calls for the Biden administration to maintain American troop levels in South Korea. President Biden has signed into law an enormous military budget bill which calls for his administration to maintain the number of U.S. forces Korea at their current level. The White House said Biden approved the nearly 770 billion U.S. dollar defense bill just weeks after it was overwhelmingly passed by Congress, despite protests by progressives and anti-war groups calling for military spending to be cut. In a statement Monday, the White House said the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2022 entails a 5 percent on-year increase in military spending. It includes a 2.7 percent pay hike for U.S. troops, funding for the European Defense Initiative, as well as support for Ukraine's military. The legislation also underscores the importance of bolstering Washington's alliance with countries in the Indo-Pacific region, including South Korea, to counter China's rising influence. To this end, it calls for the U.S. to maintain the presence of its 28,000-strong USFK in South Korea. While an earlier version of the bill was aimed at reducing the number of American troops on the peninsula, it was later removed during the deliberation process. North Korea began the fourth plenary meeting of the 8th Central Committee of the Workers' Party. Though details are yet to emerge, ways to bolster the worsening economy are expected to have topped the agenda. As the meeting is expected to continue, watchers say there also could be a message for South Korea and the United States. North Korea has kicked off a key ruling party meeting to decide on, quote, strategic and tactical policies where the regime could unveil major policy directions for the new year. The North State media reported Tuesday that leader Kim Jong-un presided over the fourth plenary session on the previous day. Without giving details, the report noted the meeting approved agenda items and held discussions, while hinting that the meeting will go on for multiple days. 
Previously, Pyongyang's plenary sessions have gone on for between one to four days. Expected to top the agenda is the economy and the livelihood of the people, which can hardly be worse than now due to crippling international sanctions and a border shutdown caused by the pandemic. The meeting will also likely to discuss the second year of the North's five-year economic development plan. In fact, watchers point out that the key party meeting will serve as a mini-party congress as the North is set to officially mark the 10th anniversary of the Kim Jong-un regime on Thursday. With inter-Korean dialogue and Pyongyang-Washington relations deadlocked, the North could also send a message to the South and the U.S. during the event. Experts further note it's highly likely this week's plenary session will replace Kim Jong-un's annual New Year's Day address, as was the case in 2019. At the time, Kim convened a four-day party session and condemned Washington for a so-called hostile act against the North. This week's key party meeting is already the fourth of its kind this year, the most held in a single year since Kim Jong-un took power. A long-running political crisis in Somalia escalated as the president suspended the prime minister who blasted the move as an attempted coup and asked the armed forces to follow his orders. Hours after his suspension, Somalian Prime Minister Mohamed Hussein Robla denounced a deliberate coup attempt by the president and called on the military to remain loyal to him. <laughs> It was the latest escalation in an ongoing dispute between Somalia's two most powerful figures. President Mohamed Abdullahi had already suspended his prime minister in September, and while the two men looked to have buried the hatchet a month later as they issued a joint call for elections to move ahead, the peace didn't last for long. A fresh row erupted on Saturday after the president called Roble incompetent and withdrew his mandate to organize the elections. The prime minister then accused the president of sabotaging the electoral process and was suspended a day later. In the capital Mogadishu, residents worried over a rivalry that threatens to further derail a long-awaited presidential poll. Ten months after the end of Mohamed Abdullahi's mandate, Somalia's regional leaders still haven't been able to agree on a date for the next elections. And the latest political row is unlikely to help the country move out of this electoral limbo. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Raging fires in southern Chile have consumed over 12,000 hectares. The largest bushfire destroyed several homes in Nabal region, leaving behind only metal rooftops and appliances. Sarah Weddington, a Texas lawyer who as a 26-year-old successfully argued the landmark abortion rights case before the United States Supreme Court, died at the age of 76. Democratic Republic of Congo is the least vaccinated country against COVID-19 in the world. Now a fourth wave of the coronavirus threatens to put greater pressure on its rickety health system than at any time during the pandemic. India gave emergency use authorization for Merck's COVID-19 pill and Serum Institute of India's Covovax and Biological E's Covovax coronavirus vaccines. The death toll from floods hammering northeast Brazil rose to 20 as the governor of Bahia state declared its worst disaster in the state's history and rescuers brace for more rain in the coming days. Israel launched an airstrike on the Syrian port of Latkia, setting ablaze the container storage area and damaging nearby buildings in a second attack on the facility this month. And finally tonight, Fans of the Harry Potter franchise were sorted into their homes before embarking on an all-day event featuring the most iconic highlights from the films of the occasions of its 20th anniversary. The event organized by Potterheads Egyptian affiliated including steaming butterbeer, quidditch matches and duels and potions. Walking around campus fans crowded stalls offering merchandise and lined up to play trivia to win points for their houses. Liquid luck and polyjuice potions were also being sold, while many of the young girls attended rush to buy love potions. The event comes just few days before the much-anticipated cast reunion set to premiere on HBO Max on New Year's Day. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. 
That's all the news we have for you for 2021. We are going to take a short break and we will return again on the new year on the 3rd of January with a new look and new sound. We invite you all to join us on the coming Monday. Wish you all a very happy new year. Good night.